Hi, I'm Graham Steele, CEO and founder of CryptoSense, and today I'm going to talk about three FIPS cryptography compliance properties that you can't check statically. So why are we worried about that? So let's say you're trying to get your application to be FIPS compliant. Normally it's because this is what your customers ask you to do. So now you've got to make it that your use of cryptography throughout your application complies with the set of FIPS guidelines about how to use cryptography securely. So how might you go about this? So one way to do it is to say, okay, well, I'm gonna make my application just use cryptographic libraries that are already themselves FIPS compliant and certified. So for example, I might take the Bouncy Castle FIPS version, or I might take uh, OpenSSL and in its old FIPS version, or it's got a new FIPS version coming soon, whatever FIPS library it is. So the point is these libraries have been certified to only do FIPS compliant operations. So one thing we can do is just plug these libraries in, make these the only libraries the application can use, and then just run the application. So most likely the first thing that will happen is the application will crash because it will try and call some cryptography that the library won't allow it to do. Maybe there's some old legacy use of SHA-1 or an old hash function like that or something uh, similar in the application, and the library, it'll crash. It's not allowed to execute that, otherwise it wouldn't have got its certification. And so by iterating, by stepping through all of these crashes, reach one of them, I can dig into the stack trace, find where it comes from, go back into the code, fix that bit of cryptography, and then go on to the next one. Eventually, I can get an application that is only calling these FIPS compliant libraries. So the question is, is my application now uh, FIPS compliant? Well, the answer is no, unfortunately. Uh, and for good reasons, getting cryptography right isn't just the responsibility of the library. In fact, some researchers from MIT dug into some real crypto failures from the CVE list and found that while 17% of them were bugs inside crypto libraries, 83% of them were applications misusing good crypto libraries. Uh, so it's not too surprising that FIPS NIST requirements contain a whole bunch of stuff that can only be governed by the application, not by the library. So here are three examples of things that your application needs to get right for your, for your whole application to be cryptogra cryptographically compliant to FIPS, even if the libraries it is using are already FIPS compliant. So the first one is uh, using RSA keys for more than one thing. So in the requirements, the DSS, which is uh, NIST publication 186-4, there's a whole bunch of requirements about digital signature and the requirements on RSA state that an RSA key cannot be used for more than one signature scheme. So there's a list of approved signature schemes, which are basically ways to do padding. Uh, and each key can only be used for one of those. And what's more, a key that's used for signature cannot be used for encryption. Now, your cryptographic library, even if it's FIPS compliant, isn't going to check this for you. If you're using an RSA key and then later on you use the same RSA key for something else, your library is not keeping a log of all the usage of cryptography. It would cause a crazy state blow up, of course, in it, and so it can't do that. So you need to make sure your application is checking that key management in order to make sure you don't fail your FIPS audit. The second requirement is around initialization vectors. So these are the values that need to be put into a, a block cipher at the beginning of a chain of operations in a block cipher mode to produce some secure encryption or, or MAC. So each particular mode that's approved by NIST, for example, in SB800-38A, has specific requirements on IVs. But generally, your library is not going to be able to enforce these. For example, particularly in decryption, you're going to be supplying the IV that came along with the encryption. There's no way that the library can figure out whether that IV was unpredictable or whether it had been used before, for example. And this can go wrong quite badly. For example, Reusing the same IV to make two different encryptions with the same key in a stream cipher mode essentially can compromise all of the plain text because there are ways that uh, an attacker can basically XOR together those two cipher texts that have got the same IV and the same key. That gives the result of the XOR of the two plain texts, and using smart statistical techniques, he can recover much or all of that uh, plain text because of the way there are patterns and redundancies inside typical plain text. So you absolutely can't do that, but it's up to your application to get that right. That's not something that the library can check for you. Finally, there's requirements on sort values in password-based key derivation functions. So in NIST 800-132, which specifies the PBKDF function, uh, it's stated that you need to have a, uh, a sort inside your PBKDF. 
Uh, and that's to make sure that every password could generate potentially a whole bunch of uh, different possible keys. So let's remind ourselves about what a password-based key derivation function is there for. So the idea is that uh, you're going to generate a key either for encryption or you might be just generating a key to store to remind you what the, the password is so you can do a lookup later. And what you don't want is that your attacker can generate a dictionary of possible keys based on a list of possible passwords. So if your attacker knows what password-based key derivation function you're using, how many iterations it is and so on, and there isn't a sort in there, they could just take a dictionary of possible passwords, run the PBKDF over each one of those and have a lookup table of keys. And then when they see a key that you've generated, try it against those to see if they can figure out uh, what the password is, assuming that that's what they're trying to do is try and crack that password. So the idea is you introduce a sort, so essentially a random value, each time you generate a key that sort can be public, we can write that down in the same place that we're writing down the key. Um, but because there's a different possible sort uh, for each password, so each password can correspond to a whole bunch of different keys, the attacker has to do the work of the cracking each time for each particular sorted key. They can't generate a lookup table of all the, the passwords uh, in advance. So it's really important that you don't use the same uh, sort for all of your passwords. You can't just randomly generate one sort at the beginning and then keep using that sort all the time. The sorts have to be different for the different passwords in order for that real diversity to be there to prevent these lookup table attacks. And again, this isn't something that your library can check for you. It's not going to keep a list of all the sorts you've already used. Again, that would be a crazy state blower. Uh, and so it's up to your application to manage that to make sure it gets the, uh, the management of sorts correct. So the CryptoSense Analyzer tool traces applications at runtime. It doesn't just try and test static properties of cryptography. We actually watch the cryptography run, create a log of all the cryptographic operations, which are then sent to our Analyzer tool, which is then able to test these kinds of dynamic properties, these properties that look at several different uses of different functions and checks, for example, that you haven't used an RSA key for two different things or used an IV before or repeatedly using the same sort on, on different passwords. So if you want to find more about FIPS compliance requirements, we have a FIPS cryptography cheat sheet you can download. There's a link to that in the description of the video, or you can find out more about our analyzer tool so that you can mechanize in your CI process, your FIPS compliance checking. Uh, there's a link to that also down in the description. Otherwise, do subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with FIPS and other applied cryptography news, post quantum, whatever it is. And I'll see you again here soon for another video. Mm -hmm.